All right, hi everybody. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk today about, this is sort of the prelude to reinforcement learning. And I, and I know I sort of, we polled you and asked you if you want to even hear a lecture about behavior cloning or not. And the, what I was thinking of exactly what I wanted to say, I thought, you know what, it really goes first, right before the RLs. And plus we have the one day week, uh, I don't have lecture on Thursday because of Veterans Day, right? So, um, so I'm sneaking this one in. Sorry to have pulled and not waited for your answer, but but I think you're gonna. I hope you'll like. It. I think it. I think you'll make it makes sense as sort of the prelude to RL. So let me um, let me well let me actually I, I had a couple administrative things. So um, for the project feedback, we're gonna try to give you quick feedback from the same people that read your pre-proposal on your final proposal, just to make sure you got a green light, you know, on 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 everything you need. But we'll also um, you know, to try to, so that means the person who read it before will read it again and confirm that anything, that any, any concerns they had or whatever was, were addressed. But we're also going to try to just, um, you know, I'll try to read all of them. I think uh, we'll try to give you a little bit slower trickle feedback as, you know, uh, to the extent possible too. Um, a few people have been asking good projects about how to set things up uh, on Piazza. Please keep the questions coming. In particular, I, I marked as, you know, please read. Uh, I had, we do have a Python only version of the manipulation station, which I wrote last time in exactly this time of the year when people were asking, how do I make the manipulation station do X? So, you know, that's not quite what it's meant for. And it's buried in C++ and hard to change, but it really can exist completely in Python now. And so um, there's a notebook there in one of the Piazza posts if, it, if you find it useful, it's easy to, easy to change. And I guess that's the main, those are the main announcements, yeah? Good, okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, feedback controllers and, and uh, visual motor policies. So last time, last week I'd say, we talked about uh, trajectory motion planning, right? So given um, either a cost function in the trajectory optimization case or just a start and a goal in the randomized motion planning case typically, um, <clears throat> you know, we had a start and a goal, we were designing a single trajectory through space. And we had some good tools to do that, and potentially tools that scale pretty well to, to large dimensions, right? Uh, as we transition to RL, RL is trying to solve uh, a bigger problem, right? So, maybe bigger problem where you know, this, the output of a motion planner uh, is a particular path or trajectory, right? And now we're trying to solve, um, trying to find a policy. Right, so that's synonymous with a controller for people who wanna think about it that way. But even in the motion planning picture, if you think of this original motion planning gives me Q as a function of time, what I'd like, um, you know, the simplest analogy for a policy would be maybe I want to do a vector field. I want to represent potentially the same sort of behavior, but instead of having just a single path, I'd like to say for every Q, not just for every time, but for every queue, I'd like to say what direction I should be going in in order to accomplish my desires, my cost, or my, you know, achieve my uh, goal, right? So it's potentially trying to solve a bigger problem. You know, this is for all Q, I'd like to have uh, some instructions. And you could think of them as representing certainly this captures, if I were to, to start at this one and follow the vector field, then it could, you can pull a trajectory out of that one, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but it's potentially saying much more. It says what happens when you're away from the trajectory. Yeah? So, uh, if I were to just do the trajectory, how would my RFC not do it following the RFC? Because the, the RFC says a lot more about the 
Good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to try to make that connection too. So the, the, the observation was actually what I'm drawing here doesn't, doesn't look so different than maybe the PRM or, or the RRT in its full glory, right? So uh, yeah, there's good connections there. In fact, since you asked, why don't I show slide one? Yeah. Okay. So um, there, you know, my favorite version of this actually is the uh, optimizing version of RRT, which is RRT star, where they very explicitly make the point that if you do that rewiring, um, then you can have a system, it's a little bit small, I hope you can see, but you can have a system that finds a path fairly quickly, but if you just keep adding, keep sampling, keep sampling, keep rewiring, then what you end up with really is more than just a path. You can end up with a policy that covers, tells you, you know, the vector field over the entire space. Okay? So you can really go from a, a lot of the planning algorithms to something more like policies. Okay, so that, so, um, and a lot of the variants, you know, you could think of it that way. Alternatively, another connection would be if you were just to do replanning. If you can, if you can plan fast enough, right, and it, then if you're, uh, if you look at whatever state you're currently in and you can execute a plan on the fly, uh, online planning you know is a policy basically and that's what people talk about when they talk about model predictive control for instance okay so there's lots of connections between these two and and actually, I, I, even in the details, I really don't want it to be uh, you're either a plan or a policy. Because um, I think there are, there are beautiful ways to sort of blend the two. For instance, like if, you, if you've looked at alpha zero, for instance, you know, um, they, I think that's a very nice way of sort of planning uh, uh, and then using the planner to build the policy and vice versa. We'll talk about that one later. Okay. So, but let's just compare the relative merits as a representation, as a as the uh, you know goal of an optimization problem or or a planning problem, right? Um, you would think that Q of T would be you know asking less, right? In, in many cases, it's um, you know it's it's not asking what it, what should the behavior be at all possible states. It's just acting asking along one particular path. Okay, so in a sense, <clears throat> you do benefit from that. Uh, in a very real way, but you can often plan for systems of very high dimensionality, and you're roughly, you know, immune to the the curse of dimensionality. The you know the number of possible states that I might have to cover with a description of a policy can grow badly, right? If I were to make a grid and have to give a discrete answer for every point on the grid, then it's exponential in the number of state variables. Okay, um, and a path because it's only parameterized by t, not by q, t is always dimension one, right? So you can say the vector that you have to put out is a little bit bigger, but that doesn't really matter, right? So what matters is that I have a single path through a potentially very high dimensional space. Okay, so in that sense, you, would, you might think that planning can scale much better. And I think that there's, there's pla certainly places where that's the case. The counter argument is that sometimes plans can be extremely complicated to represent, okay? And sometimes very simple policies can actually describe behavior in, even in, uh, you know, very complicated systems, right? So, can describe rich behavior. And I've mentioned a few examples of that before. My favorite of all time is, uh, is the hopping robot from, from Mark Rabert, where it's just, just st to this day, I just love the fact that the whole controller fits on a one page of like this super small book, and it's basically a picture, and then a few PD controllers, and it makes robots like throw themselves through the air and, uh, and had a huge impact on the field of legged locomotion, right? So a very simple controller saying roughly when you're on the ground, jump when you're in the air, put your leg out in front of you roughly where you want to land, and, uh, you know, 
the resulting behavior when you couple that with the dynamical system, which is the springy uh, hopping robot, gives you this beautiful rich output. And actually, if you had to plan a path for that, it might be a harder problem, <laughs> right? And I think that's also true if you start thinking about, you know, this is a, a, you know example of it can be very robust even if they're relatively simple plans. That's what I showed you before, okay? But now think about this as a very manipulation-specific example, right? If you have to plan every detail of that multi-fingered hand and every contact that it comes in contact with the plate, that can be an enormously complicated plan to generate, right? But if you have a simple controller that just kind of goes down until you touch and then squeezes the hand, it might be that you can write that controller very easily and maybe or maybe not get, get beautiful performance out. This is an open, I would say this is an open question and one that we'll discuss a bit today. Okay, I gotta find, a, find one that's not gonna be irritating. I think I can pause this one, <laughs> okay. Maybe I can go on to the next thing here. Let's see. Okay. So I do think um, <clears throat> the concept of planning and the concept of you know, feedback control and policies, I think both of them need to probably live in our, um, you know, our future manipulation systems. We talked about motion planning at one level, but even higher than that was our task level planner, right? So, deciding that I'm going to first pick up the mug and then I'm gonna you know, open the, the dishwasher drawer and then pick up the mug and then put it down. Right? The high level logical planner. Um, when I've described it before, quickly, we talked about that as a planner, not a policy. And, uh, and my, you know, my favorite thing from Leslie Kelbling, Leslie you know, likes to say, uh, imagine you're trying to book a vacation to Paris, right? You don't have a policy for booking a vacation to Paris, right? It's, like, it's not that you've like every possible place that you've ever gonna, you're ever going to vacation. You've already pre-recorded a solution for that, you know, and then you just look up the, the solution to that. There's, it seems like there are places in our, in our lives where we solve problems on the fly and do some deductive reasoning and do effectively planning. Okay, now at the very low level, um, <clears throat> you know, we've got very continuous motions with very complex contact mechanics or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's I will we'll talk a little bit. I think it was, a, it's a, still a little unclear, but that feels more like a control problem where you really wanna know what's gonna happen from all, different, all the different states, right? And the exact details of what happens along a particular trajectory are probably not as important, okay? So maybe at the low level, we kind of have policies. And What's super interesting is to think about how that transition happens and where up and down the, the, the ladder, I guess, um, you know, does that transition happen and how does it happen? How does it happen gracefully? Right, we talked about motion planning of the arm. That's a case of a super powerful set of tools that we have. Does it belong in our long-term solution? Depends, maybe depends what the task is. Um, <clears throat> I would even say that my position on this has changed. Right? So in legged robots, um, I think it's very natural to think about having low-level controllers. You're, you're trying, con constantly trying to not fall down. Right? So balance is a premium. The lowest level thing you want is to be like a stabilization-based you know, thing. And roughly, you know, there's kind of a nominal thing that I do. I have a nominal gait. I'd like to have that programmed in. I'd like to know what's going to happen if I'm near that, if I take my foot a slightly bad step. It feels very much like a policy to me. And you could imagine having a handful of sort of, you know, maybe a, a step reflex or just a handful of like policies that you could combine and be a very effective walker, like legged locomotor, right? In manipulation, I would have initially, I did initially, you know, like a, couple, a handful of years ago, thought it was different, right? Because um, the sheer diversity of things that we do with our hands, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, like what, all the different things we do with our hands. And to some extent, we are not in this sort of periodic, um, you know, very, very like uh, regular pattern, right? Uh, we're, it, to some extent, it feels like every time we do something with our hands, we're doing something different we've never done before, right? And maybe the situation that we're seeing in front of us is kind of, if it's never been seen before, then it really puts us in a place where I just need to figure out this one thing, kind of the single query RRT view of the world rather than the multi-query if you are, you know, trying to try to solve an entire feedback policy. Okay, um, and I still, 
I, I think there's good logic to that, right? But I've, I've changed my mind a bit. I think now that we probably do have, I mean, I don't know how high up the ladder it goes, but I do think a relatively small set of policies down at the low level can probably describe a lot of the details of what we do with our hands. And there's lots of evidence of like, people talk about the, um, you know, the, if you just watch the, the kinematics of people's hands when they're doing maneuvers, it's actually relatively low dimensional. There's like eigen grasps and there's all kinds of discussions about this. But I would think even fundamentally, I think there's, there's handfuls, hmm, handfuls of things that we do that was not intentional um, that we do that I think we probably could through practice, get very good at a small number of you know, policies and assemble them to, you know, and achieve a great diversity of motions. But I don't know. I mean, I think, I think somewhere, we're, we, we, we have to live somewhere in this, uh, in this balance. Okay, there's another problem actually with, that, uh, with this picture, right? So if I put this back, back up again, um, or another thing that it doesn't address that I wanna to, to call out, right? So this view of, um, of policies uh, from plans, this sort of Q dot is some policy. We almost always use pi for policy. That's the RL uh, notation, okay. <clears throat> This presumes that we know, or that we ha somehow have a measurement or even know what Q is. It presumes that we know Q and have estimated it, let's say. Okay, and this is, um, you know, obviously a major assumption. So, uh, for a, for an arm moving through, when when Q is just the state of the arm, and I'm doing motion planning, that doesn't feel like a bad assumption. We have very good sensors. You know, we've we've paid for the, um, you know, the nice KUKA instrumentation. It gives very accurate, uh, you know, measurements of uh, the joint positions of the arm. But if we're in this um, bigger view of manipulation, where the you know the policy really needs to know not just the state of the arm, but it's really somehow I'm, I'm making some you know, control decisions based on the entire state of the arm plus the world, right? This now is you know, Q of the robot, V of the robot you know, in general, right? Q of the world, of the environment, obstacle, you know, object, V, and so on and so forth, right? I don't have good instrumentation on the red brick, and the red brick is as easy as it gets. It doesn't get easier than the red brick. It only gets worse from there, okay? So already, you know, implicitly by saying that I've written, written my policy like this, um, you know, it sort of assumes that I've been able to estimate those positions and velocities, okay? Sometimes I don't even know how to write them down. Not just, I, you know, I don't want to assume I estimate them, but maybe I don't even know what choice of Q is a good state representation for the world, right? So um, my favorite example of that is just thinking about the problem of chopping onions, right? And then if you think about trying to write the pose and velocity of all the pieces of the onion, and maybe it changes in number every time I make a cut, right? So I don't even know what the X of this state of this system should be. Right, so that's when I say, presumes that we know Q, right? I don't, I don't even know a good representation for that yet. Okay, so what I really wanted to talk about here is a broader view of what a policy is. It's not just a map from state to actions. It's, um, it's a map, uh, potentially a map from observations to actions, and it's a dynamical system. Okay, so let me come over here. So really what we have is, our dynamic systems view of the world. I've got my plant, which is the robot, plus the onions, right? Okay, I've got my sensors coming out. I've got my actuators coming in. There's a view of the world which says that I should just write a state estimator first.
and that gives me some estimate of x, and then I can write my policy u equals pi of x hat, and I could feed that policy around to, uh, to the plant, okay? That makes, that means that, you know, the implications of that model here, which is the class, you know, a classic model that we've gotten from control, right, is that this thing has to be a perception system that estimates the, you know, the state of the onion in addition to the, um, to the robot. It has to be running at, you know, full frame rate according to this diagram. If you think about how we've used them so far, we've really kind of said, let's do perception and then plan a trajectory, and we basically close our eyes while we go and execute the trajectory. But this is asking for more. This is asking for a constant stream of sensors to be coming in and put out a constant stream of, of you know, X estimates coming out in order to make these decisions. Okay. And this has been, you know, it's been good to us in control, but it's breaking down when it gets to manipulation. Okay. This, this, you know, assumption of having a state estimator in the middle and having its requirement to, to output X hat is just too great, you know, and I would, I would say that this burden of state estimation is just too great. And it's not necessary, necessarily, to estimate the full state to make good decisions. Okay, so I think one of the great things that manipulation is doing for control is it's, it's fighting down some of these, uh, this, this model of trying to do state estimation and then control. Yeah? Right, so this definitely has the, the multi-body state, right? If I just think about what state variables did I have to declare to simulate the thing, right? In this model, this could be a simple function. Input-output function, right? No state. We're going to generalize it, of course, okay? And this, if I think of this as like a Kalman filter, for instance, or an extended Kalman filter, you know, has, has a state. It's running an internal estimate x hat. That's not the only way to implement that. You can write state estimators that just uh, you know, have sliding windows or whatever, but, but that would be a natural uh, approximation. So there would be state variables here, state variables here, and that could be a static function. That would be the classic view. As I was thinking about this, you know, I was kind of reflecting on my own journey through this process, right? So even when I was purely focused on legged locomotion um, and UAVs, I guess, we were, we were feeling the pain of this. And I would say, when people ask me, you know, what do I think, uh, why, why aren't I working on legged locomotion right now and, you know, am I gonna work on it again? I, I think this is still a limitation. We're leaning hard on this, this paradigm in our legged locomotion. Atlas has an incredible state estimation system in it, right? I mean, I think they would tell you that it could even be better, you know, but, but the inclination would be if I want to improve the performance, I can make my state estimator better, right? I think it's gonna take a big leap to break that mold and try to do control differently in legged like locomotion. But I was already feeling it, and we were, I was writing, I remember, I actually looked back just to look at the dates this morning, and I was looking back, at, I wrote proposals like in 2011 that were saying, you know, uh, we have to do integrated perception and control. That was what we called it back then, right? Integrated perception and control. Saying don't break those up into two separate um, processes. Put it into one, you know, one system. Solve them jointly, right? And a lot of people were using those words at the time. And it, it sort of evolved, right? Another, um, another name for this is output feedback. We'll talk about that. In particular, it would be dynamic output feedback. 
where I have to take, where I'm trying to design a feedback controller that goes all the way from sensors to actions. That's an output feedback as opposed to a full state feedback. Okay, and I was, I, you know, I remember struggling and struggling to convince people that this was important. Even my students would, would kind of be like, yeah, I hear you, but can we just make the state estimator better? You know, and uh, uh, in, in UAVs, we started to finally, you know, started to see as we were flying very fast through forests. That was the first project where we really started doing, I think, letting go a little bit of the full state and trying to just say we, we need a minimal sensing of the up, upcoming obstacles and that's sufficient to make our, our short-term control decisions. Okay, so our first, you know, papers and talks about integrated perception and control actually came in the UAV space. And it really, um, you know, deep learning happened around 2015, you know, 2016-ish. Um, people started calling it visual motor, especially in the manipulation space, visual motor policies. And they, I think, in my mind, they mean the same thing. And this is the word to use today. And it's really this sort of bigger view of trying to um, write a controller that goes directly from your sensors to your actions. And we'll ask the question of, does it have state inside it, okay? But this is this beautiful view of sort of visual motor policies. And in my mind, this is the reason to do manipulation for me. I think this is forcing, you know, big questions uh, that we don't know how to address solidly and control yet when the sensors are cameras or depth cameras or RGB, right? And we're trying to come in and write the best controller we know how in order to, to make an action based on a stream of, of rich visual motor sensor inputs. Okay. So this view of visual motor policies I just draw that same thing again here but zoom in a little bit The simplest thing I could write here would just be, a, as Alex was asking about, I could write that just, I call my sensors Y, which I always do, because I come more from the control, I guess, these days. Right? I could just have a static function that maps from my current observation to my current action, right? That's a reasonable thing to do, but it's limiting. We already know that it's limiting because even for sort of basic control, the simplest versions of control, the simplest versions of output feedback in control would be like linear quadratic, linear Gaussian um, optimal control. already demands dynamic policies. Dynamic controllers, which is exactly the Kalman filter state plus the LQR, okay? So another way to think about this is that this is a new dynamical system. It has its own internal state, okay? One version of that is that inside it has the state estimator which has internal state, it has the, the controller here, right? That is a version of a dynamic controller. That is the optimal thing to do in a linear Gaussian quadratic um, optimal control problem, okay, is to, to have a dynamic controller that estimates the full state and makes decisions. But that's not true in general. It is true in general that having dynamic policies can do, a, uh, can do great things. Yes? Good. So, so let's let's first just jump to say this is think of this this is a dynamical system. We think of this as an input-output dynamical system. It's got a stream of actuator commands. It has to predict a stream of sensors. I want you to think about these controllers as having the same stream of sensor inputs and a stream of out, of outputs command. Right. So this is just a dynamical system. 
Okay, so now in this in this weird case, it's sort of Y's coming in and U's coming out, but these are signals coming in, and I have a system in the middle. Okay, there are many ways to represent a system. You could have a state space representation. which is what we've been using most of the time and which we're most familiar with. I could say maybe xc is my, or maybe it should be x pi, but I'll call it c. xc of n plus 1 is some f of c xc of n. Um, you know, y of n is coming in. And then I'm saying that u coming out is like my pi, which depends on both the internal state and my inputs coming in. That would be a state space model where I have explicitly written down the state. I move forward with a difference equation or a differential equation, that state, and I'm producing my outputs. But there are also other perfectly good models of differential equations. You know, I think the one you're referring to would be like an ARA model or you know, ARMA or ARMA with exogenous inputs, which is, this is a, an autoregressive model with, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's um, with exogenous inputs. But it, it, roughly it is now pi um, takes a history of observations. Coming in. It also potentially takes a history of its own outputs, which is a little bit goofy to write it. So we've got u and y flipped here, but luckily the message is the same. <laughs> you need both of them in there. Okay, that's why it's autoregressive because it gets to see its own output. And it now just predicts its next controller. Maybe it's not allowed to see this one. Okay. This is another perfectly good input output dynamical system. <clears throat> okay. Is our, the question is, are they equ equivalently expressive, right? So in the limit, yes, so certainly for any, um, any finite horizon history, I could take that, the history of Ys and call that my state, right? And then that would be a state-space model. So you can certainly always go this way, right? You can also, I mean, yeah, so again, in the limit of infinite um, uh, states, I mean, you can always go both ways in the limit. But in practice, if you have a truncated history, right? then this is good at some things, and this is good at other things, okay? So what's an example of a, this is one of the points I wanted to make, so thank you for asking it anyway. Okay, so something that would be good, that this would be perfectly adequate for. Let's say my observations um, you know, which are y of n here, are let's say, some, some of you are working on ping pong, right? So it's the position of a ping pong ball, right? In my camera image. Clearly, if I want to take a swing at the ping pong ball and I have to make a decision just purely based on a single image, that seems inadequate, right? If I don't know what direction it's moving, I need to know something more, right? If I have a, a, even just two images, let's say, or positions of the ping pong ball, then I could estimate the velocity of the ping pong ball. That's already pretty useful. And you could imagine if I had a longer history, a slightly longer history, maybe I could filter out a little bit of measurement noise or something like that. But that would be a very reasonable um, local estimator of my velocity of my ping pong ball. Okay. If I wanted to, for instance, remember if I'm looking at the sink and I want to remember if I already opened up the dishwasher top drawer because I'm about to pick up a mug and I'm not looking at it right now. That would be potentially, if, if it's, you know, if I have to remember that a long time into the future, that would be maybe a very painful thing to try to represent with a history of observations, right? So this is good for short term. Not so good for long term, right? Memory, let's say. Okay, but it can be very clean. Like, so I get to, for instance, you know, if I'm taking just a, a, you know, a bunch of images in, I could just use a feed-forward neural network to make my prediction. That's a very appealing thing to do. We know we're, you know, we're pretty good at training those things, right? 
uh, <coughs> you know, in the state-space representation, if I want to remember the mug, let's say, or remember the dishwasher drawer, you know, that feels like a state, right? I could have x32 being, you know, is the dishwasher open? Okay. These are very uh, familiar concepts. I mean, if you if you look at even just linear control theory, right? We know a lot of things about how to fit these models to data. We know how a lot of things about how to do motion planning with those models, uh, trajectory optimization with those models. You know, same thing for these models. This is a lot. There's nothing new really about visual motor policies in this discussion, right? I think there is a choice you get to make about how you represent a dynamic controller, either with histories or its state-space representations or possibly combinations. Um, like a combination, a very a nice combination would be, for instance, to maybe take a uh, a simple filter bank of recent observations and use that as a surrogate for state, right? There's all kinds of like intermediate solutions. So when you think about, you know, the way people, um, I jumped to, to this kind of description here. So, right, if we have an input-output dynamical system, in general, you could do it in a state-space form. You can do it in autoregressive form. Ah, I forgot the other part of it. Shoot. I was basically going to write down here that uh, you know, when you think about a uh, recurrent neural network model, right, those are state space models, right? So if you see someone talking about recurrent neural networks, that's going to be a state space model. So for instance, a, a LSTM, a long short term memory. Um, or other sort of recurrent models, right? And this would be, for instance, feed-forward networks. Again, there's nothing here about, I mean, so we start, we, if we start representing them with neural networks, we've gotten into like new tools, but the, you know, the modeling framework is old and well understood, I would say. For those of you that think about partial observability, if you think about POMDPs or whatever, right, um, if I wanna have a, a, a dynamic controller that's reasoning in a partially observable environment, then X, you know, the, the common filter view of the world, you think of X as being uh, the state of the system, but really you should think about my state of my controller as being my belief representation or some approximation of the belief representation, right? So this X could be a compressed belief state, for instance, right? So you'd like to think that if I'm training a, a recurrent network policy that somehow the, you know, the internal dynamics are somehow building up a belief or whatever is necessary to accomplish the task. Yeah, the biggest thing that changed, though, is that basically, um, you know, we learned how to do computer vision, and neural networks got big, and data sets got big, and so now people are writing the policies down with, uh, you know, taking the, the entire image in, okay? Oftentimes, if you look at some of the original works, and actually a, a pretty standard sort of framework that you see for visual motor policies um, throughout is to, um, is to have a big sort of pre-trained, typically, network that comes in from the, that gets you from RGB space down to something smaller, you know, like a 32 dimensional feature vector. How did you design Z is something we can talk about, okay, but um, oftentimes there's a relatively small policy that you're gonna represent, a relatively small network. These tend to be, you know, a multi-layer perceptron with three layers and 255 units. That's the sort of standard thing, right? Okay, um, and this tends to be like, a ResNet, uh, you know, millions of parameters. Uh, and the reason is you can, you can pre-train this on a image-only task, for instance, and get potentially very good features out. And then if you're gonna do reinforcement learning or behavior cloning, you can train a relatively much smaller network for the control, given good, good, given good features. 
because tra often our control training, uh, you know, algorithms are more data hungry and, uh, you know, training all the way through the ResNet would be tough. Some people try to do it or certainly fine tune through it, but uh, that's considered hard. Okay, so the million dollar question then is, how do we design the weights of our LSTM or our feed forward network? How do we design Pi, right? And <clears throat> um, again, the, the new thing here is the cameras coming in and the neural networks in the middle, but even actually, I would say even control people have thought about neural networks for a long time also. Right, so I think the biggest new thing in is the size of these and the fact that we're jamming images into them and the perception sort of works now, right? The big answer these days, right, is reinforcement learning. Okay, that's what we're gonna mostly focus on. And I really wanna think about, um, you know, this being good, certainly down at the low level of my, um, of my ladder where I'm doing really dynamic things and I don't want to deal, I want to represent a policy instead of a plan. There are lots of people that think about RL for higher level decision making and the like. I think that's not, that's not the, the use case I'm going to emphasize here. It's not the one I believe in as much. Okay. Even RL, you know, I, people ask me, uh, you know, even in the context of, of of projects for the course, you know, like, um, I don't even know, so this is the big answer these days. I don't know if it's really a good answer, <laughs> right? So, so um, and it's not because I don't like RL. I think RL is awesome, but I think given this problem formulation, right, we should understand that RL is a very um, general purpose tool, right, um, for trying to solve pi. It makes very few assumptions. As a consequence, it is statistically very weak. So it's kind of, you know, I, I, I mean this with much love, right? But it's the thing you should do if you don't know how to do something better, I, I, roughly. Right? I mean, it's, um, and I mean that, like, I, RL research is very good. I've done it. That's what my thesis was on, right? But um, I also think that there's a lot of things we know from control, and they should be blended together. And there's many ways to find pi, okay? In particular, today, I think there's a shortcut which is, uh, we can talk about behavior cloning. And the reason I want to take that shortcut is because um, RL has a lot of um, challenges with it in terms of sample efficiency, in terms of just whether it's going to converge or not, right? Um, and it m mixes up questions about the fundamental questions of representation of the policy, is putting cameras in, you know, what should my architecture be? What should my action space be? My observation space be? It mixes up all these questions with like, did my RL algorithm perform well? Did I, did I feed it and give it enough you know, samples or give it enough rollouts? Did I roll it, you know, all these different things. And I think you can sort of slice those down the middle if you, if you take a, a shortcut and try to do behavior cloning instead. Okay, so what is behavior cloning? Right? Um, behavior cloning is a subset of imitation learning. Imitation learning is also known as learning from demonstration. Okay, I would say there's kind of two major camps in imitation learning. Um, one of them would be a sort of the behavior cloning. Where the goal is to try to um, use supervised learning to mimic um, a demonstration. Okay, and the other big branch would be inverse optimal control. RL, they're similar, where instead of trying to um, basically take a demonstration and learn the policy directly, 
you might try to um, learn the cost function. Then do planning or control or some other form. Okay, so these are kind of the two big camps in imitation learning. I think behavior cloning is uh, immediately useful for us and it's very popular right now. And it's producing just amazing demonstrations in manipulation. Okay, so um, you know the basic setup is if I have a human demonstrating, um, we'll talk about how they demonstrated, uh, you know, examples of dexterous manipulation on a robot, you could think of that as um, feeding me input-output data, right? The sensor to, to action map. And if I, if I just want to find a function which describes the same map from sensors to actions, then that's almost a supervised learning problem. Certainly I can apply supervised learning techniques to try to train Pi. Okay? That's the behavior cloning paradigm. It's an old paradigm, sorry. Right? This is um, you know, 1995, but I, you know, 89, 90 are the, one, are the papers that are sort of the seminal papers in the field, right? But um, maybe they're harder to Google because this is Australian, you know, so. Um, <clears throat> okay, but uh, already there was a, a, a rich understanding of, uh, of behavior cloning. It's promise and it's, uh, and it's problems, uh, you know, early on. And I think we've only, continue to understand uh, how to make it work well and its limitations. Okay, so the biggest limitations in behavior learning, I can sort of, um, let me see, I think I have a couple of good examples here. All right, so this is um, one of the early sort of, uh, you know, examples of how you might provide that imitation learning data for, uh, for a robot, that's Zoe. Um, That's a PR2. Is PR2 still alive upstairs? Yeah, just barely. Right. Okay, this is, uh, you know, obviously the virtual reality interface. Actually, if you watch this video, um, you'll see that she, uh, the initial version that they used had sort of like robot gripper, special purpose robot grippers. Yeah, right there. With IMUs on them. And they, you know, she was like, had a little uh, claw in her hand and it was, it was, um, manipulating things through the eyes of the robot, right? Which is important because if you want to give exactly the same inputs and outputs to your policy, then you really need to use the same actuators as your robot, right? And give the same sensor readings based on the same sensor readings. In the paper that they, um, that they wrote and then they went on to, to use uh, you know, extensively, uh, they switched to a more commodity interface that so is just HTC, HTC Vive uh, inter controllers. Okay, uh, in this, but I think it's pretty cool to make a little PR2 hand for your fingers. Okay, um, and there's a big question of just like, how, how much can you make that scale? I'll show you some of the scaling efforts at the end. Okay, but <clears throat> if you put that into a system and just do supervised type learning on it, that's how we did some, what, you know, really I think this is what changed my mind about behavior cloning and about visual motor policies was just like really, really impressive for me, robust, uh, you know, controllers that came out of this thing, uh, which were making, the, you know, the, the hallmark of these controllers is that they are making real-time decisions based on the camera-based feedback, as opposed to stop, perceive the world, you know, make a plan, go. These things, as you knock them around, they're constantly adjusting via the camera-based feedback. The, value of doing that is just so high that we're in a regime right now where our control synthesis algorithms I think are relatively weak, but I'd rather apply a weak algorithm on a rich input and, 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 uh, and get this kind of feedback out. Okay, so there's a couple things that people definitely know about behavior cloning that I wanna sort of communicate here. Some of the big ideas and, and um, things to watch out for, okay? <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, the first one is um, distribution shift. So <clears throat> what's this problem of distribution shift? So um, I said we've got a bunch of input-output data. We have a bunch of examples of Y coming in, U going out that we got from Zoe or somebody else uh, teleopping our robot. Uh, Pete did it a lot in the videos that are on the screen right now. Okay. Um, so you can use supervised learning train, but, you know, uh, I think uh, Drew Bagnell, for instance, says uh, behavior cloning, imitation learning is not equal to supervised learning, even though we can use the same gradient descent type algorithms to train it. Uh, there's some really important differences, okay? The biggest difference is um, because of feedback. And the, the classic example, I don't think you can really do it better than the driving example, which is what everybody uses. Okay, so if I've got a, someone training my autonomous car to drive or my um, video game car in Drew's original work for it, right? And I've got a, a bunch of examples of people driving and staying in the lane, okay? Then, um, you know, I've got some, a bunch of, of data, u equals pi of y. Maybe this one only requires um, instantaneous y, okay? If I have an approximation that I get from supervised learning, that's pretty close. Maybe it's, um, the original plus just some epsilon. Like I've got an epsilon perfect um, supervision you know, uh, based loss, right? Then what happens is after a single run, I've predicted almost perfectly, okay? But now I'm, I'm maybe a slightly away from where I was uh, on the original training data, okay? And what happens in the case where I take my output that's now the new state when I pass it through the controller and I feed it back through, then what I, I can quickly drift away, whereas the original training data maybe has lots of data in the lane, it doesn't take very much uh, to have compounding errors and instability, which quickly takes my system off the uh, original training data and gets, you know, it has no idea what to do once it's away from the data, okay? And you'll spiral out of control. Bad things for autonomous cars. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the problem of distribution shift. Why is that called distribution shift? Yeah. Right. The training distribution, you know, is some, you know, some distribution here. The closed loop distribution is very different, right? The on policy distribution. All right, so how do you fix that? People know the fix? Yeah. Is Dagger's algorithm is, uh, is Drew's version of the algorithm, absolutely, yeah. I would say, um, so it stands for data aggregation. For me, I always think of first uh, teacher forcing, which is similar in spirit. Dagger added the analysis, I would say, to the teacher forcing idea, okay, <clears throat> which is basically, um, keep the demonstrator in the loop as you start giving control to your policy, okay? So 
The teacher forcing version, which I, which is the older, you know, kind of version of it, it's uh, Williams 89 was the, 1989 that is, yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is the real-time recurrent learning uh, paper that I learned about a long time ago, right? Uh, <clears throat> They basically said, okay, you have this problem where you're gonna drift away from your data. So what you should do is you should start by training with only the data in, that's coming from your original um, demonstrations. But then keep the demonstrator in the loop and slowly add control. Maybe there's a, a, a knob from alpha goes from zero to one, right? And at, at the beginning, it's completely driven by the human and, only z and zero on the, on the controller and I start slowly moving the, the knob, taking the training wheels off, and letting the, the controller drive, okay? As opposed to just immediately stopping the demonstrations and starting the, the, uh, the car, the policy driving. The reason for that is you start, if you can keep the, teacher, the training wheels on, then you'll start to get data that is off the original human-only demonstrations. The policy, when it's on a little bit, will pull me away, but the human will pull me back, okay? The demonstrator will pull me back. And it starts to broaden the distribution. And similarly, as the policy gets trained off the nominal trajectory, it will be, it'll become a stable system and not an unstable system, and it'll you know, tend to stay close to the original data, okay? Dagger is the one that, uh, Drew came up with, which is data, data aggregation, um, is a, is gave some nice analysis to that, talking about the, you know, if you assume just you have an epsilon um, erroring uh, policy, then you get cascading errors, you get a, um, you know, something that grows at least at the, the squared of your time horizon, and you can, by just feeding back in extra supervisory data, the simplest case would actually be just let your, hu your human um, provide sensory, uh, you know, uh, supervision on the bad data, uh, and, and you throw that into your system to aggregate and you can sort of uh, remedy this basic problem. Okay, so teacher forcing or somehow keeping the, the human in the loop is a good remedy for this problem. Data augmentation is another big one. Okay, if the, <clears throat> and people have done this for autonomous driving, NVIDIA did this famously for autonomous driving. They basically just took their original data, they actually had cameras facing off to the left and to the right of the, um, looking sort of this way and looking this way so they could make real data that looked like it was a little bit off uh, in the wrong direction. And they basically said, the human told me to drive like this, but I'm gonna augment my data with, uh, a simple corrective policy that if I had if I hallucinated myself I didn't actually get data off this off the main trajectory but I'll hallucinate that I was off the trajectory and would have taken the simple stabilizing controller that would have gotten me back to the human based data okay and that's um, data augmentation that's one one approach to data augmentation in fact Pete and Lucas um, used data augmentation a very similar form of data augmentation in that in that work um, where they basically, as they pushed the hat or the box around, they would just take their data set and just add random pose perturbations to the object they were pushing, and then just move it back towards where the, the you know, basically the next frame in the data. Assume that, that the finger would have pushed it back into, this, into the trajectory that the data actually, um, actually followed. And you hear over and over again, people that are training these behavior cloning policies, they're like, if you don't do this, it just doesn't work. It's, you, you will not get a good policy out. A little bit of data augmentation, it works amazingly well. There's other ways that people do it. Um, people do it by just uh, adding noise directly into the, um, the supervisory signal. So another version of this would be, um, I know we've said DART like four times in the, um, in the class, but Mike Lasky had a version, um, I think in probably, 17 or something like that, um, <clears throat> where you basically add noise to the demonstrator. Uh, 
he lives in this space clearly. But basically, right as I, you know, as the demonstrator is, is doing their thing, you take their action as a suggestion, you add some random noise to it, it causes this same sort of walkabout behavior and it causes you to get some data off the nominal policy that is supervised by the human. And if you just get a, you know, enough data in the vicinity, then that can already solve the problem. There are other interesting ideas. I've seen people do like forecasting models um, where you don't just predict the next uh, step in the trajectory, but you try to predict an entire rollout. That's, a, I think, a popular thing. Um, but I, I, yeah, just to say there are, there are many other ideas out there. OK, so let's see how that plays out here for, um, for, for this example. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is um, just some, I guess, hot off the press, just some pre uh, a teaser of some of the um, uh, behavior cloning work that's happening at, at TRI. But they're, they're getting this stuff to work for incredibly hard manipulation problems now. So, uh, I mean, you can roll, roll dough. I don't even know what the state space would be for these problems, right? We can, we can have... Uh, there's a, Eric Cousineau wrote a beautiful little joystick controller that would drive both pandas around and, and spent very little time, surprisingly little time, rolling the dough. And now he can walk up, he can pick it up, he can like throw the dough down and it'll just all day long, it'll sit there rolling the dough, right? And uh, in a C1s, um, we're thinking about lots of sort of food preparation kind of examples and you know, C1s got it doing a lot of the sort of kitchen type tasks, this is he's just the form of antagonization you can do when someone's trying to put an egg on your plate is minimal, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's using constant real-time camera-based feedback, okay, to do these kind of things. It's shockingly powerful, but maybe, maybe um, misleadingly so, right? So I think it, it makes incredible demos, and the question is really, can you make it robust enough to field for the real system? So let me just tell you how Pete and Lucas did their version of it. Um, so we, we took the same sort of uh, you know, deep network front end, right? And there's lots of different ways people try to choose the Z, the output of the deep network perception part to put into a small policy. Um, Pete and Lucas had just done their uh, dense descriptor work. Okay, so they chose to have dense descriptors as the, uh, as the representation that they would put into their policy. And they asked the question that how does that perform compared to um, some other, uh, other choices for Z based on autoencoders or other kind of uh, representations, okay? So the idea was, you remember the dense descriptors, right? So we have some canonical colors, you know, in if D equals three, then we could draw the, the render the um, descriptors of the object as colors. And you would basically just pick, you know, some small number of random values in this dense descriptor space and try to find at runtime, you would find the closest points in the current image to those values and just give the XYZ location of those uh, dense descriptors. You could think of this as an unsupervised form of key points, okay? Uh, you push, push those into the policy. Okay? Maybe that's a very good representation. For some tasks, I think it's a very good representation. Okay, so the setup looks like this, and I, I'm actually going to try to reconstruct this so you guys can play with it in simulation and, uh, uh, and have the whole pipeline. So in simulation, you know, um, there was a couple tests that was just like pushing a box around or flipping up a box. Um, we have a mouse space. You can see the, um, the teleop on the real robot. Uh, this case, they actually wrote a simple hand design controller and just tried to clone from a hand design controller into the neural network as kind of a unit test just to make sure all the cloning was working, all the dense descriptors were working and everything like that, okay? Um, but, but even just a mouse, so, so Pete didn't have a, um, a virtual reality interface, he was just watching, standing there next to the robot using a mouse and keyboard and did very effective teleop, right? This was flipping up a shoe. He got pretty good at it, yeah. There is a thing where um, you can have people that are good at demonstrations or not good at demonstrations, right? And that's for reason number two, primarily, uh, which we're gonna talk about. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the network representation there was uh, an LSTM because um, 
it seemed, first of all, the hand design controller that pushed the box did have some internal state. It had some notion of like, was it in contact with the box yet or not, right? So when, when they wrote the controller by hand, they decided that it was useful to have a state variable. And in fact, it turned out that having a small um, uh, network of, a recurrent network actually did outperform the, the non-recurrent versions. Maybe this one I didn't do that very fast. Yeah. I think I was talking about flipping up the box at the time and they, uh, they did it pretty easily. Okay, <clears throat> it's a very useful pipeline, very powerful. Okay, we talked about the distribution shift problem. The second problem, and it's a real one, a big one, is this multimodal demonstrations. Okay, so in the simplest model here, We'd like it to be that the controller is, um, you know, in our, in our simplest form, if I say u equals pi of y, and let's just say it's a static function, you'd like it to be um, a perfect function of, of, of y, that, that there's not ever two, uh, uh, let's see, a situation in your data where y is the same value and there's different u's that come out, right? a, a perfect function. And this comes up all the time, even in optimal control problems. So if you remember the example I used for motion planning last time of just going left or right around the box, right, where I had my goal up here, my start down here, right? And there was a solution that went like this, and there's a solution that went like this, right? So even if I have an optimal controller, They, they are not always unique, right? In, in this situation right here, there's two perfectly valid optimal decisions I could make, right? Those are both perfectly good control decisions. If you've asked someone to teleop your robot and they ever found themselves in the same state and made slightly different decisions, decided to go left one time and right another time, then you've got an optimization problem where you're trying to fit a function to something that's not a, described by a function, okay? So this is the problem of having sort of multimodal um, demonstrations. And there's a few ways that people address it, right? So um, you can have your network can output a multimodal, a full distribution, right? Since a mixture of Gaussians or something like that. I would say that's the standard thing that people try to do. It gets to be a harder optimization problem, of course, but um, you know, oftentimes if your policy, you actually output a full distribution, um, you, know, you can hopefully capture that full multimodal uh, demonstration. There are other approaches too. Um, Pete has gone on and, and recently, in fact, he's at Coral right now. The, you know, the conference on robot learning is happening right now, so it's a good time for me to be talking about this stuff. Um, he's got a new uh, paper that, that he just presented, which is, I think, really nice, called Implicit Behavior Cloning. Which is using um, energy-based methods. I'm gonna show you the videos, it's pretty, pretty awesome. So instead of u equals pi of y, he's using a, you know, Jan LeCun style energy-based method. You try to say u is argmin of u prime, some energy u prime y. You learn a function that you have to optimize in order to make your control decision, okay? And it's, 
we've got some fantastic examples of, uh, of making this work. I encourage you actually to read the paper, but um, it was released sort of today, okay? He's got the same kind of examples, but things that wouldn't have worked with the original, for instance, trying to get this um, into a, a tight area. You see, <coughs> I think he's got a bigger view of that. Yeah, here we go, okay. So his argument here is that this was a very hard policy to capture um, because of sharp discontinuities and possibly multimodal demonstrations. Did you see right there how the, the demonstrator <coughs> had a very similar state of the block and the hand, and they took a very different corrective action in order to, to nudge the thing here. I think we're gonna see it right here. Watch right as it comes in here. Very similar state, oh, that was not the one. Okay, right there. That little corrective action is like a super small difference in the, um, in the controller, but led to a very large difference in the policy, right? And those things can really wreak havoc on, a, on an existing uh, sort of a supervised learning pipeline. So roughly they tried to learn the functions differently so that you could, they could represent discontinuities better and potentially multimodal behaviors better. Okay, this is my favorite sort of generalization that I've seen in a while of, of uh, it's basically just the blocks pushing task, okay? But it's, it's brilliant because it's got um, all kinds of logical components. These things are gonna get mixed up and be um, you know, it's got like the physics of the basic pushing a block around, but the logic of trying to have to separate things in by color and, and potentially, you know, move the blue ones first out of the way and then the yellow ones. I think it's a really, really nice example. I'd love to code it up myself. Okay, but this is just, you know, continuing to show the power, I'd say, of, of these kind of uh, approaches. A few other ideas here, okay, so um, people talk about a major limitation of behavior cloning is that it's only as good as its demonstrator. Now, that's, um, I'll turn this down here a little bit. Okay, it's actually interesting. The first behavior cloning papers argued differently. They actually said that um, because of a robot's steady hand, you know, you basically, you filter, you have no feedback delays, you can be better than your demonstrator. Okay, um, maybe a little bit. Roughly speaking, people feel, I think, bottlenecked by the quality of their demonstrations, okay? And that's a major motivation for the inverse optimal control to say somehow that the, the behavior cloning is doing the dumb thing, that it's just trying to copy the, the demonstrator without any understanding of its intent. And I think that uh, if you can try to, from demonstrations, extract something higher level and put it through a planner, you can potentially do much better. And these things produce amazing demos, but they really um, can be very narrow demos. I think this is a, a big question of how, you know, if you can put the right features in or out in order to get broader generalization. But a lot of times these demos, you know, look incredibly good, work incredibly well, in the, inside the training data, but then they fall, fall down as soon as you go anywhere off the training data. Okay, so that leads me to maybe the last point I wanna make here, which is where do you get the training data? There's some really clever ideas out there about how to how to sort of scale this stuff up, okay? One of them is this form to fit project. Kevin Zaka um, is a friend and I, I think this is just so, so clever. So um, they wanted to do a kitting task and there's more to the paper than what I'm mentioning now, but they wanted to basically, um, you know, solve this problem of putting objects into the bin, right? And that's a very hard thing to, to you know, you, you could, could take a long time to demonstrate a lot of like careful assemblies. So, so what they did is they had basically the clutter clearing kind of example we had um, code. They, they just had it disassemble all day long automatically, okay? And then they just said, well, the opposite of that, that if I time reverse the disassembly, that's a pretty good demonstration of the assembly, right? <laughs> and they generated a bunch of like, you know, supervision-based da data that just, yeah, inverted time, right? Super clever idea. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
this is the paper, the, the learning from play paper, which I think is also, it's, you know, pretty compelling, right? So that um, they're saying that asking humans to demonstrate one task at a time is maybe unnecessary and potentially uh, gives very narrow uh, uh, demonstration data. So they, I mean, I think they gave an ex a system, but they also gave sort of a pretty compelling argument that um, if you just like give people a, a robot simulator to play with, they're gonna do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Uh, they're gonna, if there's a button in the simulator, they're totally gonna make the robot press the button, right? And, um, and actually, if you just go through and, um, and then effectively label all, sim similar to the form to fit, but basically, if you take every trajectory that's rolling out, anytime it visited a state in the simulator, you have a trajectory that sort of the human chose to execute that got to that state in the world. And if you wanted to use that as now, uh, you know, demonstrations to achieve that particular state, you've got, you know, you've got a trajectory that takes you to that state. And they argue pretty convincingly, I think, that it's not arbitrary, these are like very goal-directed sort of behaviors. It's not somehow random exploration that you'd get if you were doing, um, you know, just random search in the control inputs, but it's got a very directed, goal. humans are choosing sub-goals, they're executing them, and that you can actually just leverage a pretty broad distribution of data that way to train a more general um, uh, agent. And then there are people that are trying to sort of scale things up, right? So this is the RoboTurk project, which is on, uh, has, has gotten more mature um, now, but this is one of their early versions where they're basically saying, let's make it possible for people to teleop with their iPhone. You got an IMU in your iPhone. Um, but what if you use, so if everybody who's got an iPhone has a teleop device and we put a simulator in front of them, then we can basically crowdsource teleop, right? And now they have these pretty massive data sets that have come out of, of, of online, uh, uh, online demonstration data. Right? So I think it's a big question of whether you, how far you really need to go, um, yeah, how, how far you can go with sort of human-based demonstrations for the more dexterous manipulation. All right, how does it fit with, um, you know, we talked about force control, impedance control, we've talked about um, a, a couple different sort of uh, approaches here. The output of the uh, network I wrote is just U so far, right? In an arbitrary way. But what is U? In most of these tasks, people um, they will choose, for instance, an end effector velocity, let's say, or um, end effector position or delta position. And that means you're running a differential IK or something controller on top of that, or an impedance controller or something on top of that to do, to do that, right? So, I think it's pretty rare that people actually try to put torques out of the bottom of this thing, right? It's often putting some clever controller, whether it's an impedance controller or a force controller. If you had a task that was more assembly or more welding or more uh, handwriting or something like this, you'd probably want to do uh, sort of some sort of force or stiffness control. Down here, okay? So I don't think this technology replaces the sort of mechanics-based, low-level, you know, high-gain feedback control that we know how to do well. But it can send very interesting, rich commands down inside of them, right? All right, so I think behavior cloning is like this very clever way to, like I said, separate out the question of how do you train the weights and, you know, is the representation of the policy sufficient to do incredible tasks, right? And we see over and over again, this is like, uh, this has really been happening in the last few years. People have incredible results of neural networks solving really hard, dexterous tasks from vision, right? So I think we've really made a lot of progress in understanding the representational power of these, um, of these controllers. The big question now is if you don't have to have everybody demonstrate, how do you actually train those controllers? So we'll, tell, we'll take the RL approach uh, next week. Good. Uh, happy Veterans Day.